All right, welcome back to another lecture. This is number nine. We're talking about two topics, 2.4 and 2.5. The first one is transatlantic trade. Our theme that we're focusing on today is work, exchange, and technology. So the trade is the exchange that we're really going to focus on. The learning objective is explain the causes and effects of transatlantic trade over time. So the first key concept that we're dealing with is 2.1, Roman numeral 3, letter A. An Atlantic economy developed in which goods as well as enslaved Africans and American Indians were exchanged between Europe, Africa, and the Americas through extensive trade networks. European colonial economies focused on acquiring, producing, and exporting commodities that were va valued in Europe and gaining new sources of labor. So sometimes we're going to see this transatlantic trade be referred to as triangular trade uh, that was connecting Europe, Africa, and America. And it was connecting America either from the Caribbean or directly to the colonies. Uh, America was exporting raw materials and crops, and then they were importing enslaved Africans and manufactured goods from Europe. Sometimes those manufactured goods went uh, directly to the colony. Sometimes they came by way of uh, the Caribbean. Same with enslaved Africans. Sometimes they went directly to the Caribbean and then went up to the colonies, or sometimes they would go directly to the colonies. Um, Africa exported enslaved Africans and imported rum, uh, and Europe exported manufactured goods and imported raw materials. This Atlantic economy develops. Um, colonial economies focusing on raw materials was a part of a larger plan uh, from the European powers, and that was to uh, put in place a mercantilist system. Uh, so the mercantilist system said that a country has to export more goods than it imports, and so England was using the colonies as a place to get raw materials for their exports that they would send to other European countries. Uh, indentured servitude, servitude begins to wane after 1676. That's uh, due to Bacon's Rebellion, as we talked about in the previous lecture. And enslaved Africans are being transported more and more uh, in crowded ships through the Middle Passage. Uh, on the right here, you see a diagram of how enslaved Africans would be placed on the hull of a ship. Uh, there were cramped conditions. There was not any... Uh, flow of air going through, and they would only be taken up above deck uh, at least once or uh, once every couple of days to, to get exercise and to move around. All the other stuff uh, that they would need to do would happen underneath the ship, and there'd be no opportunity to, to, to get up unless the, the people that were running the ship would allow them to go up. If there was anyone that was sick underneath the ship, in the hull of the ship, um, in order to keep other enslaved people from uh, getting the same sickness, uh, sometimes they would just be thrown overboard. Uh, that was their only way that they could quarantine people, and so they would you know, rather kill one person than have everyone else get uh, sick from whatever disease they were experiencing. Um, they were treated as inhuman. Uh, they were seen as cargo, and as you can see from the diagram, they are essentially traveling in the same place where the rest of the cargo was traveling. Um, so continuing trade with Europeans increased the flow of goods in and out of American Indian communities, stimulating cultural and economic changes and spreading epidemic diseases that caused radical demographic shifts. So we still see that there are furs being the, the main uh, trading commodity between Europeans and Native Americans. Uh, those were the ones that were exchanged in the triangular trade. Uh, the beavers would be turned, the beaver pelts would be turned into hats and other types of fashions uh, that, Europe, that were popular in Europe. In terms of cultural exchanges uh, in the Western frontier, some might happen through intermarriage, though those were very rare amongst English. Um, sometimes American Indians would adopt Christianity. And there was a uh, short attempt to try and convert natives in the British colonies through the establishment of praying towns in New England, though after King Philip's War, they will become less popular. Uh, and so on the pictures that you see on the right side, you see uh, markers that delineate where these praying towns were. Uh, and the effect of these praying towns showed that there were um, going to be Native Americans that were going to be uh, more closely aligned with the colonists. And when the Revolutionary War begins, some of these Native groups will actually fight with the uh, 
American colonist. And on the bottom right, you see there a um, memorial to the Revolutionary War veterans of this native tribe. And of course, disease continues to negatively affect those native communities. All right, moving on to imperial policies. Uh, this is where we talk more about mercantilism. So the British government increasingly attempted to incorporate its North American colonies into a coherent hierarchical and imperial structure in order to pursue mercantilist economic aims. The conflicts with colonists and American Indians led to erratic enforcement of imperial policies. Uh, so the first imperial policy was the Navigation Acts, and it was uh, restrictions on where col colonial goods could go and on what ships they could travel. So this was done to try and keep European rivals from benefiting from the English's um, colonies. In uh, 1651, the Navigation Acts are put in place, and then very shortly after that, the, the British and the Dutch go to war. It restricted colonial trade to be done only on British ships and travel through British ports, with some exceptions of perishable items. But it was hard to enforce because England and the colonies were so far away. England was dealing with wars, civil war, other turmoil. And finally, the viability of British officials. This means that the British officials that were in the colonies that were in charge of enforcing these rules were being bribed by the colonists so that it they would be allowed to smuggle their goods on Dutch ships or French ships instead of putting them on English ships. They could probably get better prices from other European trading partners than from the British ones, which is why they continued to do so. So the next attempt at greater control over the colonies uh, comes in the form of the Dominion of New England. So in 1685, the charter of the Massachusetts Bay Colony is revoked. Uh, as punishment for all the smuggling that had been going on in the 17th century. In 1686, the Dominion is created. Uh, it merges all the New England colonies as one territory and the Royal Governor Edmund Andros is appointed as that Royal Governor. He was heavily disliked by the New Englanders, um, but luckily they didn't have to deal with him for very long because in 1689, the Glorious Revolution unseats James II, Parliament asks William of Orange to come to England and be the new king. And because Edmund Andros had been an official appointed by James II, he gets quickly run out of town as soon as James II is no longer king. And then salutary neglect is going to continue in the colonies until 1763 at the end of the French and Indian War. So to recap, triangular trade connected the three continents, America, Europe, and Africa. Interactions with natives are continuing. We will see some interactions and uh, activities that are trying to convert Native Americans near the British colonies. Uh, and mercantilist policies were enacted as a result uh, of competition amongst European countries. All right, moving on to the next topic, 2.5 interactions between American Indians and Europeans. Now our theme here is America in the world. How America, at this point it's the British colonies, are interacting with uh, other nations. So the learning objective is explain how and why interactions between various European nations and American Indians changed over time. So the first key concept here is interactions between European rivals and American Indian populations fostered both accommodation and conflict. French, Dutch, British, and Spanish colonies allied with and, and armed American Indian groups who frequently sought alliances with Europeans against other American Indian groups. So this is to say that American Indian groups, though they had been the victims of and were on the losing end of a lot of European interactions, whether it was by uh, direct violence or disease, they still held agency over their future. They still were acting within their own best interest. And sometimes their own best interest was allying themselves with these European groups to try and beat their traditional rivals. So this was especially true in the Northeast uh, with the French and the Dutch settlers allying themselves with uh, former enemies of the Iroquois. Remember the Iroquois Confederacy had a large dominance over the area that is now New York. Uh, 
another way in which we see some conflict with native tribes is with the New England Confederation. It was an alliance of all the New England colonies and they had given communal powers to deal with American Indians, runaway servants, and other boundary disputes. They lasted for about 40 years and within those 40 years, they defended the, the, the New England colonies uh, from attacks that came as a result of Metacom's war. More about Metacom's war. British conflicts with American Indians over land, resources, and political boundaries led to military co confrontations such as Metacom's War, also called King Philip's War in New England. So in 1675, the Wampanoag chief Metacom created an alliance to stop English encroachment. He got several different tribes that had uh, lost territory to the New England colonists and uh, got them to agree on this alliance. So the colonists knew Wampanoag uh, Chief Metacom as King Philip, and so that's why the English called it the King Philip's War. Uh, and even though Wamp the Chief Metacom had a large coalition, there were still some native groups that were allying themselves with the British, the Pequots and the Mohegans. And the Pequots, they had already fought their own war against the, the Puritans earlier in the century. So this is just showing that they are still acting within what they see as their best interest. English and Indian settlements destroyed as a result of the war. There were about a thousand colonists that died and 3,000 Indian casualties. And then finally, the Indian resistance ended when Metacom is killed. Uh, on the bottom right side, you see a picture of a marker that shows the exact place where Metacom was killed. Uh, he is beheaded after his death and his head is put on a spike uh, to be displayed outside of the town of Plymouth for an entire generation. All right, we also got to talk about Bacon's Rebellion from the perspective of conflicts with Native Americans. So remember, farmers in Virginia's western frontier, they wanted to continue to expand and have that land be protected by the Virginia colony. Uh, at that moment, they were more prone to attacks from American Indians. The governor, William Berkeley, said, we don't want to continue expanding out west. If we do, we're going to run into problems with the surrounding tribes. And so Nathaniel Bacon was disgruntled and gets the other farmers in the Western frontier that are also uh, not content. And first they conduct massacres of the American Indian villages surrounding them. And then they follow up by going to Jamestown and burning it down. And so on the right side, you see uh, etchings of what that attack looked like on Jamestown and then uh, the remnants after it was burnt down. Uh, while they are in Jamestown during their attack, Bacon dies of dysentery, and then the rebellion dissipates. But they were a formidable force. They did defeat William Berkeley's forces when they got to Jamestown. Uh, but remember that this is all based on the perspective of uh, Bacon's rebellion starting as with a cause that's dealt with Native American interactions. And then moving on to Pope's Revolt, American Indian resistance to Spanish colonizing efforts in North America, particularly after the Pueblo Revolt, led to Spanish accommodation of some aspects of American Indian culture in the Southwest. So in 1680, we have uh, this revolt that was led by Pope, who is a Pueblo Indian, which is so you can call Pope's Revolt or Pueblo Revolt. And um, the Spanish were limiting native religious practices. They were destroying these Kachina dolls that you see on the screen uh, and trying to force them to convert to Christianity. Pope created a large coalition of all the Pueblo towns around for as far as 200 miles. Uh, and they uh, burnt down the Spanish settlements in the area and the Spanish uh, were expelled for about 12 years before they came back. And even after they came back, they ruled less harshly. They accommodated the religious practices of the Pueblo people in Northern New Mexico. All right, and to finally recap, uh, there were instances in which natives allied with European powers. We saw that in Northeast. Um, major conflicts between English settlers included Metacom's War and Bacon's Rebellion. Uh, so you can see Bacon's Rebellion as both a way that's uh, a cause for the rise of enslaved African labor and also having its beginnings over land disputes with natives. And then finally, the Spanish accommodated natives in New Mexico after their violent resistance in 1680. All right, so that is it for today. Uh, we'll have a couple more lectures left on period two, and I'll see you then.